Welcome to The Vault. Tune in every week to unlock the marketing secrets of some of the fastest growing businesses. You'll hear practical tips, strategies, and case studies that will help you build incredible marketing campaigns for your business. And now, here's your host, Stacey Keogh. Welcome to the Vault Podcast. Before I jump into this episode, I wanted to let you know that our January content creation workshop in London is almost full. So if you have been thinking you wanted to attend but haven't booked your place yet, be sure to do so ASAP. We've got some awesome businesses attending and the content we will create for your business on the day is reason enough in itself for you to attend. You can find the link to the event in the show notes of this episode. On to the show. Today's guest, Jody Rainsford, is an author, speaker, sales copywriter, marketer, podcaster, and serial writer of lists that are far too long. He used to have a very interesting career in journalism, interviewing actors and directors, and then went running crazy long races across the Sahara, across the Alps, big hundred milers, etc., before making the move into marketing. That led to him specializing in direct response copywriting, and after training with some of the best in the U.S., he soon gained a reputation for consistently writing bestsellers in the health and fitness, personal development, and business sectors for clients in the US and the UK. Jody's biggest achievements to date include running promotions that have generated more than $1 million in sales for his clients. He has since done this for clients many times over, so has proven his reputation within the industry. His agency is called Hello Genius and was developed to help disruptive businesses and brands grow sales by telling their story and building their brand. Jody also runs a program designed to show businesses how to design and execute marketing strategy themselves called the Industry Disruptive Program. He also has a book called The Engagement Formula, designed to show business owners and entrepreneurs what to write so they can attract their perfect customers and engage with them online. This chat with Jody is awesome, and he provides some great insights into what effective copywriting looks like and the difference between lots of different types of copy. So let's unlock the vault and jump into this episode with Jody. Hi, Jody. Welcome to the Vault Podcast. I'm very happy to have you here today. Thank you, Stacey. It's very nice to be here. Brilliant. Uh, Jody. I'd love you to begin by telling our audience a little bit about yourself, sort of your background, how you got started and what led you to what you do today. OK, so um, now I officially call myself a direct response copywriter, as well as the other list of things, author, founder of marketing agency and everything else. But uh, fundamentally, my, my background has always been it always been in writing or, or, or something around writing. So when I left university, um, I uh, I studied law at university. Did you? Um, so yes, yes, absolutely. Which I didn't realise how much that suited me until I met my wife, um, and when she told me that I actually argue like a lawyer and, and to stop doing it. So it's a very really about because we used to do this thing where. Um, uh, we did like a mock tribunal, mock courts as well. And, you know, you always like present uh, present arguments and then you back them up with proof. Um, you, you, know, you always have these rules about asking uh, questions that you know the answers to. And I didn't realise that much, much later on, all of that would be really useful in terms of um, in, in terms of like writing sales copy and things yeah, like that. Yeah, so, brilliant. So I studied, I studied law and then I thought, I know, I'll follow the money and decided to go into journalism instead. I uh, basically went and uh, did a journalism qualification, started working freelance, and then ended up working for an entertainment publication uh, on, the, on the trade side. And this was like around the time where uh, this was so long ago, I was covering rental VHS. Wow. Uh, anyone remembers that? <laughs> How old are you? Like, no, just kidding. My specialism. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I listened to say, say Betamax. Yeah. <laughs> I was covered. They still had rental stores um, and Blockbuster was still in the UK. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so basically I, I started, uh, I, 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 you know, very early on, I w- was writing for a uh, publication, doing interviews, things like that. I'm going through a really interesting time in the entertainment sector where basically uh, digital disruption was coming in, things like Love Film and Netflix were disrupting it. Was, it was really interesting. And then I moved over to the consumer side, and that was you know lots of uh, basically on, on on film and 
publication, so um, doing stuff for um, like various um, uh, publications. That's meant so I get to go to lots of um, really glamorous sounding things like, uh, you know, red carpets and into celebrities and directors actors and stuff like that which why do you say wonderful. glamorous sounding and not actually glamorous well it's just it, the the thing is everyone th- oh, it, so it is great when you first start doing it because you think oh it's great i'm gonna meet all these people and then you realize like act you know, all these amazing actors and stuff you see on the screen um it's fundamentally quite dull um and you go to like a press thing and they've already inter- you know, been interviewed by 400 other people and you know you you you're speaking to them and they're not they're not that interesting and then you sort of sit there and go mm, i don't know you know after a while it sort of wears off it's not less paid profession either i think yeah i think i'm letting anyone into a secret that and then i obviously that had some kind of effect on me doing that for for such a long period and i uh, had a, a midlife crisis in my 20s <laughs> I decided to um run across the sahara um oh. out of the blue um, when I did the uh, Marathon de Saab. Um And uh, that's when I changed my career. I started work, run, you know, working in the running and uh, fitness press. Wow. Which was uh, started running for, like, a magazine came along called Men's Running, um, which when I was doing that, I started writing for them. And so I got into the health and fitness side, which is very different from, uh, from entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. And then I decided I was going to switch over to marketing. So it was about time that, you know, uh, actually getting paid a lot of money for uh, journalism was it, it was it was reducing massively i uh, things about you know moving into marketing marketing something i was always interested in and so i decided to uh decided to bite the bullet and, and become a copywriter which um kind of were unheard of really um uh, specifically advertising sort of direct response copy so i went i, I, went, I thought you know well go to go to the place that knows how to do it the best went to a, a conference in uh, las vegas and uh, met some of the you know biggest um uh, direct response copywriters in the world there um got a mentor um who i uh, with different programs um uh, met another copywriter who sort of took me under his wing took me how to be a, a freelancer recommended me to some clients got my first gigs with them uh, all u.s clients and then really my my reputation sort of built from that i i was responsible for uh, various uh, sort of six figure then seven figure uh, promotions um you yeah, know and then we're talking about you know these are the type of uh, sales letters that um that people absolutely hate that you know you think you, you see them they're like five thousand six thousand words really really long sales letters on the page you know they, they may sound a bit hypey they may sound you know they look a little bit brash and everything but they work really effectively for the right market and so I became a, a copywriter doing that type of thing. And so, yeah, built up a reputation for that. Started um, an agency uh, in the UK called Hello Genius, um, where we use uh, direct response uh, principles um, because people don't really teach direct response anymore. When um, when sort of direct mail disappeared uh, in the UK, everything went to creative copy, even even like the big agencies like Ogilvy and Mather, you know, where direct response was, was really sort of in the ascendancy, they've all switched over to creative copywriting. And so that the art has kind of been lost and it's, it's come back again with digital marketing because it's all about metrics. It's all about um, uh, conversion rates. And so you're actually refinding that art of crafting great copy that actually gets people to take action has come back. And so, and that's really what, that's really where, you know, it takes us up today where, you know, working with people and working with businesses to effectively get people to get people to take action and you know um, make sure that they really understand what it is that they're where their money is going and you know what the what the return on investment is for every every penny they spend so that's where we are in the agency you know as an agency we basically help people do that um it's it, it's a lot more different working with people in the uk than it is with people in the us uh, and I, i'm sure you know that there are you, you you've got experience working with with both sets of people yeah and and we you know we, we basically write all sorts all sorts of copy i train my copywriters up to, to write the same way i do and uh Hopefully, hopefully uh, the clients that we have um, will attest to how happy they are with, with the results we get them. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I want to take a one little step back and ask you about your company name, actually, because Hello Genius. I mean, that is a genius name, really, isn't it? I love it. Where does that come from? It's really interesting. I went through this period of uh, coming up with different names for, for business. And uh, I was going to start an agency. I've got a friend of mine who I worked with um, for a while. And we were, we were going to start an agency up together. Um, and for some reason or another, he, he actually went off and went to work with Apple in the end. So. Okay. A little bit disappointed. He didn't think working with he was gonna was yeah. as good as working with Apple. I mean, what was he thinking? <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> Who do you think he is? Um, and so we and, and we we always thought, oh, let's go for something really traditional, something really you know that's modern 
but sounds like really tra- tra- traditional. And then I decided, okay, I want, I want something completely different for the thing that I start. And I was trying to think up something around, you know, um, uh, communication, um, something being smart, something being um, just, a, just a clever way that people talk to each other. And so Hello Genius is, is nothing more difficult as hello meaning communication and genius meaning clever. I like to tell people that that's how people generally greet me. Yeah. But that's <laughs> I like that a lot. That's good. I'm really, I'm really curious about names, and it's kind of funny because force my staff to say that to me in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you walk into the office, hello, <laughs> exactly. genius. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm obsessed with names because I think it's one of those things that's really challenging. And funnily enough, like just recently, I found a lot of businesses. Uh, I work with a lot of different, you know, entrepreneurs or, or investors and things that own multiple businesses. So I'm often approached, you know, we might be doing a marketing campaign for one business, but then they'll approach us and say, hey, I'm launching this other company. Like, can you help us come up with a company name? And I'm like, well, that's not really what we do, but I kind of like the idea of that. So why not? Um, and we go into these sort of crazy brainstorms, just trying to identify company names. And it is tough. And we can be super crazy and just out there and a little bit weird sometimes. So um, I would just find it an enjoyable experience but i think understanding where people you know how people come up with coming names i just find so interesting so that's awesome yeah and, and the thing is now it's really difficult i mean before you could come up with a company name and you'd be fine but in in like a much more globalized world where you also have to take into account things like trademark, you know, you know, trademark <laughs> um and availability yeah i mean especially with like you know intellectual property as well uh, and whether you can actually enforce the name that you that you have totally because it's not just about it being enforceable. It's like, does the brand name actually deliver what we need it to do? Um, or is it too descriptive? And I, I studied intellectual property law as, as, as one small part of the um, uh, law degree that I did. So I, I remember snippets of it, but so I wouldn't take any legal advice from me. But um, I, but, it, but it's, it's a real minefield. And because it's much more digital, it, it used to be a case, you know, you could, you could come up with a, a name and it didn't really matter if someone in America had it or, yeah. or anything yeah, else yeah. like that because you would, you would never deal with that. But now we, we live in a world essentially where... Well, with digital, you can't escape it. Everybody is everywhere, so... But it brings opportunity in terms of like, you know, the world is, is literally your oyster. But there's so many things to, to take into account and, you know, especially with names and... and, and, and and, and cultural differences with names as well, because we've had lots of different ways that people describe things which offend various cultures, depending on what you work in. So yeah. it is, yeah, the, 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 the how people come up with names is is, is great. My agency, it's got a really weird name. I don't know if you've come across it yet, but it's Brand Lective. So it's B-R-A-N-D-L-E-C-T-I-V-E. People cannot pronounce it. <laughs> I cannot spell it. You know, from one side of things, it's not the best company name, but I actually started out with a really common name or a, a name that I really loved. But as it turned out, even though I incorporated the name, I then found out about trademarks and all this kind of stuff. And I was forced actually to change my brand name. And I was so nervous about that, running into that same issue again. And fortunately for me, it happened in the first like month of being in business. So it wasn't like I'd invested loads in the brand and all that kind of stuff. But I was so scared of that sort of thing happening again that I was like I went through every possible option in terms of brand names and in the end I just decided to make up a word because I was like so nervous that I would run into you know someone else's copyright or trademark or IP and it was just really nerve-wracking so yeah I basically decided to be like Google and just blend two names like Facebook you know (laughs) um (laughs) They called it brand lighter, but that's sort of where that came from. And loads of people always ask me, where does the name come from? And I'm like, I literally made it up. <laughs> the problem is, I think a lot of people, and we, we, we experience this uh, particularly, a lot of people get really hung up on what their company name is. Uh, and if you're, if you're a growing company, it doesn't actually matter that much. I mean, the amount of, the amount of conversation we have to have about, um, about logos and talking about brand names and, and everything, uh, when really that's not something that's too much of an issue until you get really big and so i know it's really it's really important to do it but but sometimes people get really hung up on it um, and it's really difficult to turn around and say actually no one cares what your name is what they really care about is what what you can do for them yeah absolutely and the thing is that like, you can create your brand so what the name is or what it looks like or whatever doesn't necessarily matter until you launch it and you create that whole brand around it with with your copywriting and i guess we'll get into that and with your tone of voice and and the imagery that you use with it and you can essentially create this you know it's like if i use that example 
example of Google, for example, Google, what did that mean before Google existed? Didn't mean anything really, right? Um, but now you know exactly what it means because of the work they've put into developing that brand. So, you know, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of people get really hung up in those early stages and sometimes it's just like, just get out there, just just launch something and then and see what happens. But so you talked a lot there about sort of how you got into it and, and sort of essentially, um, I guess your core offering is around copywriting, which I find super interesting. And I, I'd like you to talk to us about, I guess, the different types of copy that exist and why you might need different types of copywriters. Um, because, you know, for a lot of small businesses out there or, or businesses just getting started, they might not necessarily think about, oh, I need a sales copywriter or I need a creative copywriter or I need a direct response like what i guess start off with the basics like what's the difference the one thing that really um that holds us all together in terms of copy is the fact that you know and this is something that i'm, I'm sure that you've, you've come from the same perspective from the discussions that we've had but really at the heart of what we do it's it, it, we're, we're we're marketers and we're copywriters but really at the heart of what we do is it's all about the audience it's all about who the end customer is and it's all about the research that you do in order to uh, fully understand who that person is, what motivates them, um, all the factors that that go into um, them making a buying decision, um, how they think about uh, what happens in their life, how that relates to your products, and everything else like that. So the, the one thing that we do, uh, the one thing I certainly do, and, and basically my, the agency has been built out of um, this process, um, is go through like a, a really heavy research process that we've that we've kind of got nailed down now um and we, we actually call it the, the genius approach um really <laughs> yeah, clever there so, what I've done. Yep. Um, but yeah, so it's a, it's it, it's genius approach and so um and it's, it's a series of steps that we go through in order to fully understand the the audience and so the one thing that really surprises people is when when i say that you know i take six weeks to write these like five six thousand word sales letters is that you know three or four weeks of that it'll be research that'll be actually looking at looking at various things um related to that and really understand what it is that that, that motivates by or really understand it when you work with an audience for, for a long time you learn that so for example one of my audiences one of my clients in the US they have an audience that is very different from me you know completely different different age different way of thinking American of course and I'm you know I'm British so um, so there's a the cultural difference there but I know the audience so well I can write in the voice of that audience so well now because I've been doing it for, for, for three years and so I can really gel with it and that's about really understanding your audience. And so that's the that's the, the first thing to overlay onto that, that actually copy isn't necessarily about the writing element of it. It's about understanding the audience, because when you do it well, you don't actually have to guess at what it is that you're writing. You can actually just go back to, to the research that you've done and to the conversations you've listened to and to the, the information that you've drawn from various sources that, that, you know, that inform who your audience are. You can actually draw on the conversations that they're having and the language that they use and, and, and the problems that they have. Understanding that's really important in order to understand the psychology uh, and everything that goes behind it. Um, so the different types of copy, the, the, how that fits into that is that there are different types of copy depending on where people are in the sales and buying cycle. For example, you know, the, the, the human brain. So I want to start talking about some brain science here because I love getting into this. Um, so so tell, me, tell me if this bores you in any way or if I'm waffling because I, I, can, I, can, spe- I can talk about this for, for <laughs> two hours worth of podcast. But Okay. Fundamentally, there are there are different aspects in the human brain. Um, we, we, you know, the, the brain has um, three different parts. You've got the uh, the neocortex at the front, which is, deals with the logic. You've got the the limbic brain, which deals with the, uh, emotion at the back, um, and then you have the uh, the brain stem, which is um, uh, sort of like our, our the, the primeval um, uh, part of the the brain that goes back to our sort of the fight uh, fight or flight. Now, when you are when you're crafting. Uh, copy or when you I made that sound very very artistic there when you're crafting copy I try to stop that sound. when you're writing copy um, or, or trying to appeal to your audience you have to appeal to different things and so essentially in terms of content and this is relevant for copy or any type of marketing and um, there are two things you need to do you either you're engaging someone or you're converting them um, and those are very different things to engage someone you're you're capturing their attention you are building a relationship with them you're developing trust with them drawing them in and this is the sort of like the content that I wrote when I was a journalist. It's the stuff that you gets people reading, gets people interested in something, gets people you know di- diving deeper into a subject. Conversion copy is very different. Very, conversion copy needs to do all of those things, but it also then needs to start switching into almost like a salesman 
or salesperson um, uh, mode, um, using you know psychological triggers, using sales psychology and things like that to actually get someone to take action. And so the different types of copy you need all depend on what 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 you're trying to do within your business. So for example, if you're a business and you want to engage and get the attention of people, say on social media, um, uh, through your blogs and things like that, you you go for normally for uh, a content writer. Um, and so a content writer will you know do the search on your audience and understand yeah what are the what are the key things that audience are, want to know about depending on what stage they are in the buying cycle. So like very early on in the funnel. So they'll be able to draft blogs uh, which will focus on um, content that is helping that person or that target customer um, to understand the problems that they may be facing to move them closer you know, along the buyer cycle to actually help them, you know, educate them, inform them um, and show them how to, you know, it's almost educated them enough so they can then, you can then move them to a point where you can start converting them. So you've got, you've got sort of blog, uh, things like that, blogs, um, almost like white papers, reports. You, you, you normally use content, content writers for that. Um, when it comes to email copywriting, um, that's you know, when, you've, when you've basically got the contact details of someone and you're starting to develop a relationship with them, hands down, email is still the most effective, despite its huge decline in terms of open rates and everything else. Um, and you know, with, the, with the issues with GDPR, Email copywriting is uh, slightly different. It, you, know, you, you need to be engaging, but you also need to uh, be developing a relationship over a long period of time. With something like that, you're almost like becoming a, a screenwriter because you're, keep, you're trying to keep people interested to, for the next instalment of the email you're going to send. No one ever, ever signs up to that, um, you know, sign up for our newsletter uh, box that some people have on their websites. People sign up for your email because they're interested in hearing about something that helps them move closer to their, their particular uh, whatever. Whatever their issue is or challenge, yeah. And so you need to you need to do that. And in some way, in some senses, GDPR has been a good thing because it's actually sort of shaken the tree a little bit and made people actually think about what what email's for. Um, and then when it comes to sales copy and direct response copy, that's when you've got people to um, a point where they're ready to buy. So um, one of the things that yeah, you know, I'm sure that you've heard, I'm sure that listeners have heard, is about people buy an emotion and they uh, justify with logic. Um, and so when you start using things like sales copy or conversion copy, you've got you, you, you're, you're dealing with people who have emotionally bought into owning something or, or into the solution you're offering or to the you know, whatever the product is you do. And so you're using you're using whatever means you can in order to do that. So that may be you know, sales emails that may be sort of sales copy on a on a, on a website on a, on a sales page in a website that's getting them to take action. And that will be very much the success of that will be very much judged in terms of, you know, the actual the conversion rate they'll get whereas when it comes to the engagement copy you know the blogs things like that that'll be sort of read rates that'll be the amount of time they've been on the page so you're dealing with two different the outcomes are very different from them the thing about the sales letters that i write you know the seven you know six thousand word sales letters is that they're trying to basically compress the entire journey that someone goes on in, in one go you know when you send on a sales letter you go from being a cold prospect all the way through to buying. And that doesn't really happen in real life. Um, you know, normally with a business, you know, you'll see something that someone's presented to you and you might read a couple of their blogs, you'll watch a few videos, you may you know, have some sort of email correspondence with them because you've inquired, you may look at a few more of their blogs. And so the relationship develops in a much more natural way. You still have that, you buy into them emotionally and then you, 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 you sell to them uh, using logic. And so you, you're really using direct response copy to get people to take action. So things that I always ask for when we start working with people are things like, you know, how big is your database? Uh, have you actually sold your product before? Because um, a lot of people try and come, you know, to with a product that sold, so you don't know whether there's actually a market for it. And, you know, what are your conversion rates as well? So improving conversion rates is, is, is an important thing. So th that's where you, you'd really benefit if you've got a product that, uh, like for direct response, if you've got a product that you know sells well, if you've got a market that wants to buy it, and you've got existing conversion rates and statistics that demonstrate those things, uh, then actually bringing in someone like a, a, a conversion copywriter, a direct response copywriter, um, can actually you know, massively lift that. And and it's that kind of thing that, that, that expands a business, you know, allows them to scale up very, very quickly um, in terms of what they're trying so to do. So with that direct response uh, copywriting that you do, are you doing it predominantly through store direct mail or is sometimes that would that be email marketing or how are you how are you so the, you're producing the content but then how are you getting it out in front of that audience or does it depend 
It completely depends. Like people, different people have different things. You know, so um, some of my clients, they will bring in me as a copywriter. I will write a, uh, the only thing I will do in the entire pro- launch project will be to write that, that sales letter. Um, and then they'll have, they'll send uh, uh, Facebook uh, traffic to it. They'll send, they'll have affiliates that go to it. They'll have, uh, they'll email their list uh, and, and, you know, uh, their existing list, which will have been, which will be a warm list and people will go to it. With other people, it'll be something as simple as, you know, they've got a, a large database of people who um, are warm, but people don't tend to be buying. And so we'll have a look at, like, say, their email uh, sequences and say, OK, actually, you know, the, the, you, there is there is opportunity here to sort of increase sales and things like that. And we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, some people, it's it's something as simple as actually building out all parts of the, you know, doing the copy for all parts of the funnel. So all the way from um, writing things like um, blogs, uh, Facebook ads, blogs, um, trying to get them to to download something or leave their details, and then nurturing them um, with a with an email sequence and and getting them to buy after that. So so it all it all completely depends. It's very difficult because different industries and different di- different sectors, um, yeah, exactly different audiences, and that's that's the difficulty. I mean, if it, whenever you have someone comes along and said, oh yeah, we've got this system that that will work in your industry, you're like, well, that's a very very big difficult claim to make but there are general things that you know to all fundamentally everything comes back to engaging someone you know grabbing someone's attention um uh, getting their data building a relationship with them um and and selling to them and that you know it is really that simple and whether you do that through you know social media is an amazing opportunity but and, it, and it's great for in terms of the copy that we write because it forces you when it, when twitter you know had so few characters it forces you to be concise to, to, to deal with a specific message very very quickly and get someone to take action one of the most difficult things is you know writing writing like Google ads, um, because you have to try and capture as much value in there and as much you know you have to use all the benefits of headlines and and every curiosity. Very short character counts, yeah. Absolutely, and it, you know, and, it, and it forces you to think. You and it's but it's about thinking about what journey you want your audience, your your target customer to go on, and writing the the copy that's congruent throughout the entire process, so that it does it does all the things you want it to do. Um, get, gets their attention. It uh, it gets them to leave their details details um, because you're providing something of value you're building a relationship with them um, you're showing them you're building no like and trust you're showing them you can provide value um, and then you're eventually selling something to them yeah let's talk about headlines for a second because i think that's relevant not just for adwords but also for email subject lines for blog posts headlines all that kind of thing so how important do you think the headlines are when it comes to producing content it's really interesting on a on a, on a long sales letter if I was to draw a like a pie chart of how important the yeah and I showed you know, had the, the importance of different bits of the um, uh, of the sales letter were, I would say you know a headline is like ninety five percent important. It is insane because the thing is, if you don't get the headline right, then you don't get their attention. If you don't get their attention, it doesn't matter. They're not going to read the, the five thousand words after that, or you know the email campaign after that. Everything else that comes after that is wasted because you haven't got their attention in the first place. So the headline is the most important thing. It's the it's the and it's the hardest thing to write. And but the, I mean the great thing about digital marketing, the great thing about social media, the great thing about everything like that is that we we can now test these a lot quicker. You can fail a lot a lot faster with them. So um, you know in the past with um, you know the, the, when you bailed out a promotion, um, you know back in the in the seventies with with direct mail. <laughs> And I'm not from the 70s, by the way. I'm not at all. Um, but back in like the 70s, 80s, you know, when you had direct mail, you know, it took weeks to to find out whether you know whether something would be effective. You can you can basically do a test now to see you know which of three or four headlines resonate more. And and a really interesting thing is that you know one of the, one of the clients in the US they come up with their product ideas based on um, how popular um, some of their like YouTube videos are and how popular some of their emails are, and those are all based on headlines. And so they you know it it has that you know product is marketing and marketing is product yeah so at the moment people think oh no i don't know what to write about or i don't know what headlines do you just go back and have a look like what have people your what have your people clicked on what have you been your most popular posts what things have resonated with them you know what is it they fundamentally want headlines are hard and it's not just the thing is when it comes to like a sales letter or something else it's not just the headline we, we, we talk we normally bunch something called the lead in as well so the headline and the lead so sometimes the headline can uh, is there to grab attention so it'll be something sort of controversial or something that'll you'll really stand out 
and then the lead will say, is, you know, get them to read the next line. And the lead will then ease them into it by it's normally doing something like building a little bit of empathy or talking about their challenge or, you know, talking about them. And that's and that's that's the big thing. I think too many too many businesses and too many brands, you know, they're, they're, they're like they're, they're always talking about themselves. And actually, it's the audience that you know the people are just obsessed with themselves, um, but fundamentally selfish. I, don't, I, I always get a little bit of a gasp whenever I say that to people. But people are fundamentally selfish. We want to hear about our problems, and there's nothing more powerful than demonstrating empathy to someone. There's nothing more powerful than you know hearing someone read your inner thoughts back to you about the challenges you're facing. Uh, and so, in, what is that a way to connect with somebody or captivate their attention? there's two ways that you attract someone's attention uh the best way one you shout out um uh, you know their name amazingly now online it, it, people have gone over that you know seeing your name in something will normally mean spam doesn't it so you know, you, 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 people have, have kind of lost that the second way is shout out their innermost fear uh, talk about the thing that they that they're, they're worried about day and night and so there's a there's a phrase by uh copywriter robert collier who talks about getting inside, getting inside the conversation already going on in someone's head. And that's essentially what you want to do with, with the way that when you think about your audience, what are the things they're thinking about? And it really shocks people to find out that they're not thinking about your product 100% of the time. <laughs> they do have other priorities in their life um, because you're not, you're not just competing with you know, um, your competitors or other marketing messages. You're competing with every single thing that they're doing right now. When someone's, you know, sat, uh, you know, you write a blog or you, you post something on Facebook, they're not just looking, you know, they're not just competing with other things on Facebook. You're competing with the surrounding environment, with their mobile phone, um, you know, with the cup of tea that they've just spilled on their hand, with the fact that they're looking at their feet and they've got different colour socks on, the fact that they've got to, you know, rush off and get to pick the kids up because they're already late and you know all the other things thinking about so what are the conversations going ahead and when you understand that when you understand what the fundamental way that your your audience thinks then you can write headlines headlines that re are really powerful that really get into sort of like burrow deep into your brain and sort of keep you up at night thinking about um and do you typically write your headlines last or first first um, first okay so it drives yeah what you're doing because i found um with content blogs and, and sometimes news items and things like that that i might start off with a headline and i guess if i go in a slightly different direction that i might come back and kind of rework it and sometimes you come up with something better a little bit later so i've always been curious so uh, to be honest like when i'm doing when i'm doing long sales letters it is the thing i come up with first um because you, you you need to know the lead because everything else will flow from that so you'll create a headline and a lead and then everything within the sales letter will support it it's a little bit different for for things like when you're writing facebook ads for people or writing blogs and the social media stuff we generally have an idea of what we want the the headlines to do but then it, like you say like redrafting them and, and it, it happens a lot um especially with that type of stuff because better stuff comes on but generally there, there, there'll always be there'll be like elements to consider so a really powerful headline formula that we that we use which I suggest people use it if they can't think of it. It's like a benefit plus curiosity. So you put a benefit or a desire that someone wants, and then you add something, uh, some element of curiosity to get them reading. So then uh, this is kind of the thing that BuzzFeed and uh, an upviral when it was around did really effectively. They say, you know, when she stood up uh, to sing, you won't believe what she did next or something like that to get you to read it. And you, you see a lot of those as well. They're very clickbait. But they they work really really effectively. But to make but what they lack is they lack a real understanding of who their audience is. So to write really good headlines is to really understand your audience and to call out the benefits uh, or the pains or the challenge that they want to deal with, and then using curiosity to to get them to carry on reading. So you mentioned clickbait there. Yes. <laughs> What's your view on that? I mean, it, it's it's died out a little bit now, hasn't it? Because I think people have become savvy to it. They know they they know when those I don't want to say fake headlines, but almost driving traffic to. I've never understood clickbait because I think if you're driving traffic towards something that doesn't, you know, when I think of clickbait, I'm thinking a headline that is so captivating and draws you into something, uh, but then then shows you content about something else. Yeah, it's really interesting because you're you're absolutely right. It, it breaks that trust. That's kind of what you have to avoid when when you're writing copy because it's it, it's very easy to grab someone's attention by saying something shocking. But if you're if you can't continue the conversation after that, it, it it's kind of pointless. 
and and that's and that and when when we come to email marketing, this is exactly the thing you know, that you you constantly see people doing using like a shocking headline that will get someone to open and then immediately say, "No, oh, I just did that to get your attention," or um, you know, this is nothing to do with this. And so, but it breaks that trust. It's a bit it's annoying, nothing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a bit annoying. It's, it's infuriating, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, it's like that. There was that, there was that um, old ad, wasn't there? That it, it basically was a it was like a square ad that went in a newspaper, and it had like in big letters "sex," and then in tiny letters, "Now that we've got your attention, we want to speak to you about car insurance." <laughs> and, you're like, and you're like, and while that's quite funny when you first see it, like everything is like that now. I mean, it, you know, that's that that kind of epitomizes clickbait. You just can't do that. You have to you have to be congruous. You have to be able to resonate with an audience and then and then keep it going because like you say like the the tolerance for 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 bs now is is so low and and things like you know testimonials and proof and making claims people just don't believe stuff anymore you have to work so hard now yeah to to really build that trust and that's and that's great in some way but it, it just it makes it a lot harder if you've got a great product and you've got great testimonials and everything like that you can still fall down by not presenting them in the right way but it, it puts you in a much much stronger position I was going to ask you a question about email marketing. We've touched on it a little bit already, but I suppose when you were talking earlier about using the difference between, I guess, a content copywriter for engagement versus sales conversion. And obviously with email, you need to do a little bit of both. Is there any general rule in this, in terms of in an email, would it be, I don't know, the first couple of lines are all about engagement and then there's always a conversion at the end? Or is it more of a combination of, you know, there should be five or six emails that are all about engagement and then one really strong sales copy? Just so much of that depends on your audience. I I started off writing emails uh, with the point of view that, it was all about engagement. It's all about constantly having people, you know, constantly making sure that that audience is reading, constantly making sure that they are, um, that you have that touch point. And that was blown out of the water when I did a, I did a 30 day email challenge where I, I literally emailed every day for 30 days um, at, with a call to action in every single email and, and it increased sales. And I, you know, I got a few complaints, uh, more grumbles rather than real complaints, uh, but it didn't do anything. And so there's not really a hard and fast rule. I, I think there is, I, you know, I think maybe emailing every day is probably a, a lot for, for for some people. It, it, a lot depends on the industry you're in and, and w- what you've got to say. I mean, if you are if you are in a you know uh, the kitchen business and you have customers on there who bought a kitchen, it's not it's going to be another five ten years yeah. before they even think about another kitchen again. I don't know what you're going to be able to say to them. <laughs> in the meantime. Every day. <laughs> depends on the, the sector you're in and what you can offer the one thing is that it definitely needs to be engaging even if you don't sell uh, selling it that it has to be engaging and the main issue that people have I think, well there's two issues the main issue the people the two main issues people have is one they don't know what to say they go well, i would email the audience but i'm not selling anything at the moment or i don't i don't know what really to say to them and the second is uh, you know how often do you do it how often you do it is fully dependent on how well you do the first thing and how well you you, co- you you speak with your audience and that completely depends on you know who they are what they so one of the key things i was talking about before in terms of understanding the audience is that if you probably understand the audience you understand their interests and things like that it means you can talk about their interests for example if you know that you're, you know, you may be selling something that's a regular purchase, but you, you don't need to you know constantly uh, sell it in every email. Um, if you have an audience, for example, you know likes rugby, you can talk about rugby. You can be entertaining and talk about rugby. You don't even have to tie it back to your product because people will be interested if you are interesting. The most important thing to to, to do with email marketing, which I think you know. Uh, it used to be a case of you, you could just send people information that would be useful um, and, and you know, just basically give them value again and again and again. That kind of has come to an end because people just – they store it up and they don't use it and they don't take action on it. And while it's good to have a touch point it's, and it's better than doing nothing, what you really need to focus on now is being entertaining and actually re- engaging, having an engaged audience um, and getting them to, to come back. And, it, you know, it's bit, much like – much like on social media, you know, if you have a profile that, you know, no one's interacting and no one's engaging with, you know, they'll, they, they, you know, they don't show it to other people. You know, you don't get the, you don't get the reach you want to get. And the same, same with email. If you don't create emails that are engaging, that people are responding to, that people are reading, 
you're doing yourself a disservice. And so it's, it's really about entertainment. It's really about using things like tone of voice and really um, uh, building a real a real connection with the audience. It's, it's a difficult thing to do. Um, but the first thing starts with, you know, actually actually emailing your, your um, customers on a regular basis, which so few people do in the first place. Yeah, well, I'm glad you've mentioned tone of voice because I feel like personality in branding and I guess copy is a huge part of that is what gets my attention for sure. And I guess, again, it depends on the industry and, and demographic and things like that. But talk to me about maybe like a what's your sort of favourite, I guess, copy to be producing. Is it something that has real character and sort of interesting language that you're using to sort of entice an audience? Or what's your, how obsessed do you, do you get with tone of voice? Oh, tone of, tone of voice is everything. I mean, it really it has the the thing is you you could pretty much in some in some sectors and in some professions uh, and with some marketing you could simply change the tone of voice you use in your in your marketing on your social media on your website and you will stand out in your industry without doing anything else. It has the ability to transform it because everyone wants to have a, a you know have a, a, a sort of a very clear tone of voice a very specific tone of voice something that's very unique to them. Until it comes down to it, <laughs> when everyone goes, oh, I love the way you write your emails, or I love you, you know, you, you, know, you, can, you can be like opinionated, or you can do other things. When it comes to it for their own business, there's a, there's a real nervousness around. Yeah, it. right. They go a little bit bland almost. Uh, yeah, I mean that's it. It, it, it. We've developed this this kind of business voice, thinking that you know people are it's professional uh, people are, or something. We're professional. We're thinking about business. They want to hear about business, and fundamentally that is absolute rubbish um, because people people just want to be entertained and people think so it, it's not really about having a tone of voice the thing you need to do is have a strong tone of voice it has to really I I the example I always use is it's like going to like a traditional Italian restaurant um, and having that feeling that sense of place you know when you walk into an Italian restaurant and you know you've got the you know the, the faded picture of the gondola on the wall um, you know the, the fourth generation Italians who are still speaking as though they've just left Italy uh, you know that warmth and everything. You you feel like you're like when you read. You should be able to basically cover up the logo on your website or or cover up the subject head on an email and read an email and know who who is speaking based on on the way that that email is written. If your if your tone of voice is that strong, and it's it, it's such a powerful thing that so many businesses haven't cottoned onto yet as a way of really uh, making themselves stand out really building that real rapport so i mean i was i was talking before about uh, basically sales copy being salesmanship in print you know it's like having a salesperson there well the thing a salesperson can do is that they can shake your hand they can talk to you when you're face to face you know you can make eye contact they can put their hand on your shoulder you have all of those you know um uh, non-linguistic elements to, for, to build a bond with them you don't have that when you're trying to sell to people remotely. You don't have the eye contact. You don't have anything else. So what do you have? You have tone of voice. Tone of voice is your secret weapon to uh, to build rapport with them, to to build trust, to get them to think, yo, you're on my side. And that's everything from the like the tone you use to the language you use to creating phrases which you know make them feel part of the tribe, make them feel part of a community. So it's 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 really powerful stuff. And it's it's just about uh, it, the difficulty is is unless you know like what your values are and what you stand for and how you want to speak to your audience and everything like that it can be very difficult to, to come up with a, a tone of voice um, or find your company tone of voice and so it, it a lot of it comes just through really expressing it and writing and and bringing it out how um, challenging is that for you then working with customers are you are you able to convince clients to embrace that is that something that you help them to do is there any is there ever any resistance to it well, like any good agency, we trick them. Um, so what we do, we take them, we take them through the process. Of, well, there's, there's, a, there's an element to that. There's, we take them through a process, really. Of like when we're talking about the audience, we're talking about the audience and what is, what's important to their audience and what is important to that. So we, we normally do the whole audience and customer research first. Um, and then we talk about the values that the business has and the things that they want to do. And normally from that comes out a discussion about, you know, are those things currently communicated in the way that you speak to your customers in the, in the communication you have? And so it, it very naturally arrives at the tone of voice understanding why things like tone of voice has to change and why why you know how you can improve the tone of voice uh, across your communication um and the other thing is that it, it, tone of voice isn't just a copy thing it's not just a marketing thing um that tone of voice has to almost be embraced across the business so that you know again, again it comes back to congruence and trust i'm firmly of, you know, believe about you know we have we have this thing we call the eight touch points of brand and that goes through from the first time someone sees um, an advert by you through to the first you know time that they inquire through the first proposal you give them to the first 
time that you know they want to leave a review to the first piece of work that all of that has to be completely consistent the tone of voice in which you do it and be a bit there's some businesses who are great at that like virgin or brew dog you know the really strong tone of voice they it's really consistent regardless of what element what part of the operation you interact with them um i i, I, I just think it's one of those really untapped areas that you know so many so many businesses if they just were, were, were willing to you know really embrace it and, and bring some real personality both you know uh, of themselves of the founders of the of the, of the staff in there because it, it, and it and the other thing about it is that it, it work it works inwards as well that that, to- that personality and that tone um has a, as an inward effect it makes it makes it a good place to work at you know, if, if everywhere if, if it feels fun yeah it becomes it's, part of your culture almost doesn't it that's it that's exactly it it's a it's a, it's a cultural element that exudes through the company and exudes outwards as well. So yeah, it's normally we we, we arrive at that decision having having had the, the big discussions first. And is there? I guess I'm getting kind of sucked into this because I'm, I feel like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm tricking you into. No, it. <laughs> I love it. Like this is I love this. We're very much into branding too, and it's like you know we've put our brand guidelines. We delve into this in quite a lot of detail and. So I'm curious for you with your agency, like, do you ever run into an issue where I have a lot of clients approach me that they just want something done now. It's like, I want this implemented tomorrow. All right. Need, you know, we, we need some content and it has to go out in five days. So all of this is all well and good. And I, and I would love to get into all of this detail with every client that I ever work with. But I do find that sometimes people are just like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's worry about that later. Or let's get into that later. And how do you handle that? Are you finding, do you just push people back and say, Hey, listen, like we cannot produce results unless we have this, these sort of rules or, you know, brand guidelines in place or how are you handling that sort of response? Or does that not happen to you with the clients that you're working with? Sometimes says like, we have a, we have a project we need to launch it very quickly we need to like bring out these emails and we need to you know make it sound as though like the big the big concern that people have is that the things that we write don't sound like them. It's the number one reason why someone doesn't hand over stuff. Um, they know the need for it. They know we can do it. It's just does it sound does it sound like me because I hold on to it. Um, and so what we do in that situation is that we we can very quickly produce some um, tone of voice guidelines around it. We very quickly sort of we'll go back, have a look at emails they've sent out in the past, have a look at the content that, that they've put out, listen to some of their videos. We'll have the conversations with them, so we'll get sort of an idea about the rhythm of the way they speak and, and everything like that. This is where you know being a journalist. Um, uh, helps in a way that I didn't realize. I didn't realize it. I thought all those journalism years were completely wasted down the drain. But actually, I gained something from it. And the thing was, you know, when you work for different publications, you take on the the the, the voice of the publication in different ways. You know, some are humorous, some are serious, and things like that. And so, you can pinpoint. There's certain elements about tone of voice. You can pinpoint certain things that they do that allow you to be able to very quickly write in in in, in the way that they do it. The thing that more and more we're finding um, in terms of what it is that people say they want and say they need, it is becoming more and more standardized. There are becoming more things, you know, we know, for example, that they say, oh, we want to send out a series of emails after. We know that there are certain numbers of emails you need to send out after a webinar. And, and we won't deviate from that. We'll just say, well, we could, you know, you've got, you've got this, you want five, we're, we're saying that it needs to be 12 or I want to send some emails to do this or do that. And we will say that we, we don't think that that will work for you. So we, you know, we, we will write, is, yeah, exactly. Our suggestions yeah. do. And, and, and by and large people will do that based on, they will, uh, based comply. On suggestions. <laughs> they will comply. Yeah. Very rarely has someone said, I, I demand you write some emails, you know, that won't work. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, they, they they generally do comply because I, once once you go through the process of, of, of explaining it, it's a bit more difficult for you because there's the, there's an immediacy to, to to what you do that probably isn't quite there as much with some of the stuff we do on 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 the, on the copy side. Yeah, copy is so interesting because it's one of those things that's so valuable, and maybe this is unfair for me to say, but in some ways undervalued. No, absolutely. The thing is, the problem is people. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I I have this conversation with you, and I tell people, you know, I I write things which you know have made millions for people, and a lot of people think, well, that that would never apply to us. It would never, you know, apply to our business, and and so they okay, well, if I hire a copywriter, they'll be able to come in and they'll be able to do that. But there, there have to be certain things in place in order for, like, say, a direct response copywriter to bring real value to your business. You already need to have elements in place which will um, accelerate that a lot more. 
there's always a way of using a using a copywriter to do something within the business that's going to be it, it, the, the main benefit i think a, a copywriter will bring or you know it, a direct response marketer of any sort is they will get force you to basically go back and look at your audience and understand the you know the way that your audience buys um the triggers that they have those kind of things which will which will you know improve your marketing massively regardless in terms of actually what a copywriter can can, can bring to your business um, it is massively undervalued because the it's the problem is it's not very really interesting everyone thinks they can write every you, know, you can <laughs> so true <laughs> And, you know, most people can do an okay job. That's the thing. You know, yeah, you're not yeah. going to say, and you, know, you can you can go on, um, uh, you can go on Fiverr or you can go on Upwork, and you can get someone to produce something, and and it will save you time. Um, and most people don't know what good copy looks like. Or yes, don't know, doesn't I think know what... that's that's where I was getting going with that because I feel like there's a lot of businesses out there that will think, okay, you know, a good copywriter is expensive, like they really are, and but because they're worth their their weight in gold, really, it's like, uh, I guess you know, and it's like trying to get a business to understand that actually. Actually, when you do go a little bit cheap and try to wing it and just get things done really quickly and you know you're not hiring the right person necessarily that you're not going to get the right result and then again that's where they think oh it's under you know it's not really worth it should i be paying that much for copywriters etc well that's it and it's for example you know with the with the, with the high-end direct response stuff that i do my my fee would on the fact when you look at it it's expensive but when you see the difference that it can make Someone who has pushed it, you know, who has the potential to make um, several million dollars out of a um, out of a promotion by making sure that the conversion rate goes from two to four percent. They can see the value in that because they know the difference between two and four percent is a million dollars. Therefore, your fee is a small part of is a very very small part of that is worth it if you're not in a position to do that. Which is why when I, when I when you know when you ask me the question about what's the difference between copy, well, engagement copy that is judged by how much people read it, um, the the engagement that you get with it, the you know the, the the bounce rate from it, the fact that whether people you know um, uh, share it, that that's how that is that's judged. Conversion copy is based on 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 yeah very, very metrics. It's based on sales. It's based on the actual conversion rate. And if you don't if you don't know the impact of increasing that conversion rate, then you're probably in a position to be using a direct response copywriter. Um, and so that's what, that's what. But that is one of the uh, this, this is a challenge we constantly run into. That is part of the educational thing that you know I'm trying to bring to as many businesses as possible, showing them you know when you understand your 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 numbers in this area, you can see the value that improving your copy can have. Uh, and, and you know, improving your copy can be as simple as changing a few headlines, changing a few bullets. I mean, I did, I did a, a landing page for someone. It took me twenty minutes. I changed like two or three bullets, and his conversion rate went from forty percent to fifty five percent. He's he's pushing he's pushing you know tens of thousands of people through that every week. So that's going to make a massive difference. And, and it was just through a few, you know, changing a few, things and understanding a few principles that yeah, improves that. Unless you're measuring that conversion rate. It can be difficult just to understand the value of it, and that's because you know it, it kind of it's kind of was a coming back again. Digital marketing is much more um, much more metric focused, um, and and so it makes it a lot easier to to show the effect on it. You know, I can say, right, I've written the copy on this Facebook ad, and this Facebook ad, and this Facebook ad's converting higher because of this, and so you can demonstrate the value in it when you understand the metrics behind it. I suppose case studies for you must be super important too, because once you can, you've got those examples to show this is what I've been able to do, then it's much easier to get that client to then convert. Absolutely. And it's really clear. I mean, you know, I can say sort of real specifics to say, you know, when I launched this, I, you know, it was a rate when I stopped, when I wrote the thing, the, the version rate went up to this amount, that was worth this amount to the audience, you know, they're now selling this amount of units a month. And, and so, yeah, they, they're, they're much, much clearer. The difficulty is that it's working out how to get, how to get that position. And, you know, it's, it's that undervaluing element that, um, uh, that I constantly battle with. And it's part of the reason we set up the agency to be able to provide the content. So, yeah, whereas we're very much grounded in direct response, the agency's based around um you know producing that engagement content about the blogging about the you know, facebook ad content about um, the emails and everything else that goes it's about the whole essentially put up the whole funnel to help people build the whole thing i mean when i was talking about the difference between the u.s u.s clients will get you and say oh, i need a copywriter to do a sales page it tends to be uk they go i, I need you to build the whole thing that's kind of what we have to, what we have to do uh, the whole thing in order to make sure that you know you get the results that you want in the end 
So obviously being so heavily involved in copy and understanding that whole writing process, that must be a big part of your marketing pipeline in terms of what you're doing in your business. Um, but is there anything else that you're doing in terms of maybe social media or what 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 kind of things do you do out there about to, to get the attention of your audience? So the good understanding um, uh, Understanding how to put headlines together and understand about engagement and everything is it, 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 it makes it really easy to structure other things. So things like video. Video is a really, really important part of the business for us at the moment. And uh, engaging our audience using especially Facebook Lives. As you can tell, I I can't stop talking, and so. Uh, <laughs> but also, you have got, you have good personality too. Like you're very. Uh, uh, well, thank you. That's. A very, very <laughs> I don't know if we've let it shine talking. so much on this podcast, but um, <laughs> no. But in real, like, you're quite funny. Like you've got, you know, I can tell you, you let that shine, and I think that comes from your brand too, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. That's the thing, and uh, but that's the thing is, is you know, I'm constantly, you know, saying and saying to the team, you know, we're doing these, we're doing these presentations. Are they? Are we being bold enough? Are you? Know, is this an expression of? Does this actually speak to who we are and we want to attract? Uh, and so, and they think, and, and you can't hide on video. That's a great thing, you know. You actually, have to get on, get yeah, on the camera. Yeah, especially live video, so, you definitely can't. <laughs> No, exactly. But, you know, I, I, I'm confident enough, you know, that um, I, you know, I've trained the team enough and I've, you know, I've you know, got people in there who have skills and great talents. And you know, actually being put on live and, and being asked questions, you know, no matter how much preparation you have, there's a bit of pressure. But I think it really shows confidence. And again, so few other people are doing it. You can really stand out by just, you know, doing doing things that other people won't do. It's not there's no there's no real rocket science to it. But um but yeah, so so sharing knowledge, basically getting out and talking about copy as much as possible. I'm a I'm a, you know kind of a real evangelist for the power of the copy do to, uh, to to someone's business um and transform it and take it from you know from successful to incredibly successful uh and so yeah so that and you know um um i've got books um uh, one of which is coming out soon i've already got a book um, and those those bring in a, a lot of leads a lot of interest fortunately i've got I've, I've got a good reputation so i get plenty of referrals that way and um and so yeah we have various things I, I started doing some training as well and that, that's worked very effectively and also have a um a pro specifically helping disruptive businesses um build out an entire marketing strategy so that was an area that we had as being um something that was been asked for a lot so coming in helping someone develop a, a, an entire marketing strategy and all the way from audience going all the way through to actually build a campaign around it and actually get this working while we're doing it and so you're just using all principles in that. And so that's, you know, we don't, we, it's, it's far too much. <laughs> if I'm honest, we do far too much. But, you know, we're, we're on social media, Facebook, everything at the moment is Facebook for us in terms of what we're doing, just because we know our audience is on there and that's the place to interact. And we're, we're good at interacting. We enjoy interacting with them and, it, and, it, and it's fun. So that's the, that's the most important thing for us. It is. That is an important part of it, too, I think. Make sure you're enjoying what you're doing. Otherwise, what is the point? When I was working in the uh, in the like film and entertainment industry, I was a big film fan, and then working in it for such a long time, kind of, kind of, um, for me, and I couldn't watch a film or TV for, for like two or three years afterwards, and then I went into running, and that kind of killed it as well. Um, it hasn't quite done that with copy, but I'm certainly uh, I I came to a point when I, it felt like I was getting burnt out um, in terms of like the the output that I was doing, the amount of writing. And so um, as I've built the team, fortunately, I've managed to step back from that and I can take a more strategic view to things, work, work a copy that the, you know, the, the, the big letters, the big sales letters. So I'm still you know, keeping that um, that source sharp and, and, you know, and then doing as much as I can to get out, speak on you know, on podcasts like this and on video and produce our own content um, in, order to, in order to get that to, to as many people as possible. So any final thoughts for us? Anything you'd like to share? Top tips? How would, um, you know, maybe for our listeners are very much in the sort of startup, um, you know, just getting started or maybe small businesses with just two or three members of staff. Uh, so they're, they're usually trying to do a lot themselves. So where's, where's a good place for them to begin if they're, if they're just sort of, I guess, grasping copywriting and, um, and even tone of voice and, and brand guidelines and things like that? Like where, where's a good place for people to begin? So I think the first thing I mean, if you're if you're a startup, I mean, we we're in a startup accelerator, so we've done some uh, the, the things around audience and about your your customer. So the the first thing I play I, I 
do is really focus on um, building out who your customer is and who your audience is, um, what it is they like, what it is they like to read, the things they read, things like that. And that that should really get the whole thing together for you in terms of understanding, you know, what we need to be talking about, how we need to be engaging with our audience, the sort of messaging. Um, and I do some kind of competitor analysis. I'd have a look at, you know, who are the other people in our sector? What is the tone of voice they're using? What can we do to, you know, to, take a step up a little bolder than them do you know, do think are there the, the, the big thing that, um, that I'd like to bring in that and this actually is, is a bit of a trend that's come in is about this this whole connecting about how this having a mission and having values and it has to be really authentic in order for it to work um, but having something bigger than the company that you focus on um, and being behind something campaigning for something so this whole idea of a campaign or activist brand you know, can you, as a business, as a business startup, can you like um, connect with something or connect your audience with something like that um, in order to, you know, uh, uh, to, to build that rapport with your audience and build that bond with your audience? Because that's the important thing. So focus on your audience, focus on, um, uh, you know, think about what your competitors do in order to stand out. Uh, write like a write like a human being. I mean, the important thing is, you know, it's not it's not really that difficult to just write as though you're writing to a friend, or talk to a friend, or have conversations as though as though, as though you're with a friend. Um, one of my um, my my good friend, my my, my uh, podcast co-host, he is he's brilliant at cold emails, absolutely brilliant. Um, he recently secured a sponsorship on the on our podcast by writing one of the best emails I've ever written and he wrote it <laughs> and, it, and when I read it it was as though he'd written it to me uh he wrote it with such uh like charm yeah. and uh, it was relevant it felt like he really knew me he felt he was really interested in what I was doing and so it just you know understand that it doesn't matter whether you're sending an email to uh, a supplier or you're sending an email to a customer or you know you're you're, you're sending an email to um another member of staff just think about the tone of voice you're using. Think about writing like a human. Think about it. Um, talk, talk about benefits rather than the features. You know, really focus on you know what. Right, I mean, this is a big thing if you're a tech startup. You're you, you're probably obsessed with benefits, but think about what is it uh, about features. But the thing is, think about what does it do for the customer. Sell sell the outcomes of it. Yeah. I think things like storytelling a lot more. As well. That's a really big thing. Um, you know, tell stories rather than you know do case studies. Um, you know, tell stories rather than, um, uh, you know, show someone how to use something, show, you know, how someone has used this, what the problems were they have. And think of it like a, like a, a bit of a soap opera. Start with a point of high emotion, um, you know, that someone was really struggling with and, and lead through and how, how your product, and that. Um, things like that make a, make a massive difference in terms of the way that people can engage with your brand. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are just a couple of things I'd, I'd suggest if you're a startup doing. Yeah, brilliant. I love that. Thanks, Jodie. <laughs> Right. So tell us, how can we connect with you? So how do we find you online? What's the best way for our audience to get in touch? So um, we have a website, which is hellogenius.co.uk, and there's a, there's a few resources on there. We also have a YouTube channel, which is um, Hello Genius Live. The Facebook page is probably the best place because that's where we put most of the content out. So that's facebook.com forward slash Hello Genius Agency. And we also have a Instagram, which is again Hello Genius Agency. Um, um, the, the one thing I would really suggest doing is if um, if there's some stuff in here that you found useful, um, I'm delighted if you if you want to download um, the Engagement Formula book, which is the book that I've, which basically talks a lot about what we we would about how to create engagement copy and how to build out um, some of the some of the content that you you want to write if you're going to try and write this yourself. And so if you go to hellogenius.co.uk forward slash engage book the um that's there to download for free have a read of that um i'd love to find out what you think um but there should be uh, lots of tips in there um about how to have the right content business in your brand perfect i love that we'll link to all of that in the show notes too to make it nice and easy for everybody so again thank you so much for have, uh, being here today i've really enjoyed our conversation and i think you know obviously we have a lot of uh there's probably a lot more detail that we could have gone into in all of these areas but i think you've given us some really interesting things to talk about and i hope our audience will take a lot away from it i really do encourage them to reach out to you connect with you follow what you're doing online and potentially reach out if they think there could be a good partnership there so thanks again jody thanks so much for having me on the show oh i love that fantastic episode with jody here are my top three attention grabbers from this show attention grabber number one know your audience jody gave us an example there where he said it will often take him or a member of his team up to six weeks to write 
5,000 words of copy and sort of preempting that a lot of people might find that to be quite a long period of time. But something that is really important is before you write any form of copy, you must know who you're speaking to. You have to know your audience. So making sure that you invest the time in understanding who it is that you're trying to get the attention of, who it is that you want to actually be buying your product or service, you have to know that before you start investing in copywriting. So know your audience. Attention grabber number two. We talked about company names there and Jody made a point of like, nobody cares what your company is called. And that made me laugh and it made me kind of reminisce on uh, the process of choosing a company name or even a brand name. And I do get that question a lot from a lot of our clients too, where people really do overthink that process a lot. Um, but I think it's important to remember that it's it's the way that you build the brand. It's the way that it ends up sounding. It's what it looks like. There's so much more that goes into a business brand other than just the name. So don't get too bogged down in names if you're not if you're in a position where you're starting a business soon and that's something that's holding you back. Just try to move past it. Pick a name, get going, let your brand build out what that actually means, like a Google or a Yahoo or a Facebook. None of those things meant anything until the brand was built. So just pick something. Attention grab at number three, people buy with emotion and justify with logic. Jody spoke there about the human brain and saying that there was a logical part of the brain, an emotional part, and a primeval part. Before looking to craft copy or write copy, uh, you want to think about, are you trying to engage people? Is it engaging copy that you're producing or is it conversion copy? There's so many different variations. Having in mind what you want the end objective to be should play a role in how you produce copy. He spoke about email copywriting and email being still the most effective form of copy despite the decline of email and the introduction of GDPR and all that kind of stuff that everybody gets bogged down about. And that's true. We experience this in our agency too. Email still has an incredible rate. The ROI on email is brilliant. So don't rule out things just because you think they're on a decline. Uh, it's really important to use the right type of copy, reach the right type of audience, depending on what your business is. So really, really important and just great content, I think, there from Jody. That's it for this episode. Make sure that you head over to the show notes to find all of Jody's social media links and his website. You'll also find the link to my upcoming content creator one day workshop in London. Tickets are on sale now. We have a special booking code to give all of our listeners a 10% discount on that one day workshop. The code that you want to use at the checkout is VAULT, V-A-U-L-T, VAULT. Book your ticket today to ensure you make 2019 a year of incredible content for your business. Tune in next week for another great episode on The Vault. You've just been listening to The Vault Podcast with Stacey Keogh. If you've enjoyed the show, she'd really appreciate you leaving a review on iTunes. And don't forget to head over to www.thevault.global for more free content that will help you build an effective marketing strategy.